anyway, enough about that. Let's move on into the material. And uh, I've got my handy dandy pointer here. Okay, here we go. Good. Um, so the introduction here, we're going to start with the term horticulture. It's uh, derived from Latin terminology. Uh, hortus is the Latin term for uh, hortus and uh, colere um, are the two terms. Uh, culture of gardens, so it's, it's culture of gardens versus fields of, of uh, crops, small scale, relatively small scale and intensive uh, of planting. Um, we're looking at uh, fruits and vegetables primarily, as well as medicinals, herbs. Those things are grown on a, on a relatively intensive scale. Ornamentals certainly fit into that bill as well. They're, we're talking about those things that are grown around a home, or if they're grown commercially, they tend to give a lot of intensive management practices versus a large field of corn or a large field of barley or cotton, something to that extent. Um, so those are the two terms, and um, we're, we're looking at, at uh, a variety of crops here, commercially and ornamentally grown. And typically these crops are very high value, and they oftentimes tend to be very perishable as compared to agronomic crops and other things grown in agriculture, food, other food and fiber crops. And the, the key thing is the intensive management, where, we, where they're oftentimes given a lot of, uh, of intensive management in terms of water, fertilizer, and we even try to manipulate the environment. We have them in a greenhouse, for instance. So we put a lot into those crops as compared to these other agronomic crops. And be, they can be grown with those inputs because they, they generate a higher value and when they're sold. And in many cases, um, horticulture is really an art and a science. There's certainly science behind most all the practices that we follow, but implementing them and carrying out the science is oftentimes an art form, as in how it's implemented and how it's carried out in an effective fashion. Uh, oftentimes, this intensive management requires us, or it results in us manipulating the environment and or the plants themselves. <coughs> Physical manipulation of the plants, we might change light intensities, we might, because we're growing them in a smaller, totally smaller confined area, sometimes we can manage that environment manipulate the environment to the benefit of the plants or to the benefit to benefit the, the product that the plant's producing, perhaps. And we're also interested in this, this uh, interactions of the environment, the plant genetics, and the plant processes that are going on. We have to understand this interaction here in order to know how to effectively manipulate the plant or the environment to get the results we want. And so we're going to focus in this chapter a lot on this kind of stuff here what plants are, how they, how they grow, and how they respond to environmental conditions, the science aspects of it, so that we can understand the, the art or the manipulations that we might want to employ to get the desired product out of those plants. So you really have to have a good grasp of these understanding and understand these fundamentals. And these will go, if you have a grasp of the understanding of, of plant science and plant physiology, you can, you, can, you can really go a long way with that in terms of understanding why plants have problems, how they react to pests or disease problems and so forth down the road. It gives you a good basis to go forward on. So what are green plants? Well, they're, they're, they're living organisms, of course. They're not mobile. They don't have a conscious, so to speak. They, they don't think. They don't, they don't react in a conscious manner to environments. They do result, oftentimes respond to environmental stimuli, but not in a conscious mode, like they're not thinking about it like you and I would. Uh, typically, plant material is about 90% water, depending on what plant parts we're talking about. But uh, it, it will vary a little bit. But it's a really high percentage of the plant material is typically wa water, and if you have very little in dry weight matter in there, it does vary, as I mentioned, from plant to plant, from part of plant to part of plant. But as a general rule, it's very high water content. They are able to produce their own food. They're really kind of factories to produce their own food. We'll talk more about that process in a bit. Um, they are, <coughs> excuse me, they are composed of cells, individual cells like we are, and groups of cells can specialize and form tissues, and those tissues can specialize even further or can uh, work together to form organs, as we do in our bodies. All our, body, our bodies and all biological organisms have cells, and they have this hierarchy of combinations of cells to do specific tasks or provide specific functions and features within the, the organism. 
Um, so organs and plants, of course, we'll talk more about the parts, but we have leaves, stems, roots, for instance, are the gross morphological features of plants. Those would be specialized. Each one of these is made up of, special, of cells, and they're specialized uh, cells within each of these major groups that, that form tissues and, and allow the organs to form and function properly. And what we'll spend some time on is these essential processes. And all the essential processes that we'll talk about later are occurring at the cellular level. They're taking place in, in individual cells, either within all the cells in the plant in some cases, or oftentimes in specialized cells in certain organs or certain tissues that carry, are capable of carrying on these, these, these essential functions. So a little bit more about the cells themselves in plants. Um, in plants, the cells have a, typically have a rigid cell wall that, that surrounds the plant, somewhat protective. Not all biological organisms have that. Uh, plants are somewhat unique in that, that feature. There is a, uh, uh, key, key components to cells would be the nucleus. It's oftentimes this darkened area in a cell if you look at it on a microscope. This would be a, a two-dimensional look at a cell. They're not always specific blocks in cells, but, or in plants, excuse me, but they tend to be kind of blocky, three-dimensional, like a, like a concrete block or a brick. Uh, there'll be the rigid cell wall surrounding it, each cell, and then in between each of the cells there's oftentimes a kind of a gooey substance um, in there that kind of cements them together, holds them together, and there's usually a lot of cellulose in the, in the cell wall, gives it kind of that rigid texture and structure. The nucleus is the is the center and is the uh, kind of the brain center, so to speak. Even though the plant isn't thinking, that's where the genetic material is, is in there. The DNA of the of that cell is in there, and enables the cells to, to divide and and and, uh, and number. So all the genetic code is in the nucleus for each cell. Uh, the cytoplasm would be the living matter other than the nucleus around there. It's all the uh, and which is largely water. The wine is large. Is, is a big. It's actually a big balloon with a rigid wall around it, full of water. Uh, and in that water, there are a number of dissolved organic compounds um, that we call the cell sap, or whatever you, uh, is a common name for it. There's usually a vacuole in there, and oftentimes the vacuole is really 90% of the cell itself. It's a, it's a big bladder in there that's full of this, this sap. And there would be a membrane inside this cell wall that's uh, what's termed as is differentially permeable. It, it allows certain substances in and certain substances out. It controls what goes in and out of that cell. That's the selective permeable membrane that, that I'm just referring to here. It's, it's kind of this dotted line inside this, this block here. And so this a cell becomes the basic functional unit within the plant organism because all those essential processes are occurring within this cell that we'll talk about later. And each of these, when we have specialized cells, like in a leaf, for instance, that are doing certain things, they would have specific functions that are unique to leaf cells that are not maybe the same as root cells or flower cells. Okay? But there are some underlying basic processes that all cells undertake but there may be specialized processes that occur only in certain cells. But it's all occurring at, the, at, the, at this level, this microscopic level within the plant. And it's also important to understand that um, we talk about, we'll talk about plant classification now a bit. Um, that gives you the basis of how a plant is structured, the cells are the basic structure. <laughs> We're going to talk a little bit about classification, and we're going to come back to those essential processes in the next form. But I want to talk about plant classification for a minute here. And we can classify plants in a variety of ways with a variety of terms. One of them uh, is by, one way of, of categorizing them or classifying them is by their growth habit or life cycle. Some plants are annuals, some are biennials, some are perennials. And those terms are kind of relative but it, it, it relates to how long it takes a plant to go from, uh, from a seed or to a, an, an immature form to a mature form and complete its life cycle. Annuals tend to do that in one season or one year. 
Biennials usually require two years. First year they usually just grow vegetative parts, leaves and so forth, and then flower and fruit or flower and produce seeds the following year. Perennials uh, are capable of, of living for multiple seasons, multiple years, I should say, uh, and they may they may go through this growing leaves and, and then flowering and, and fruiting on an annual basis or on a, a long, on a multiple year basis. They don't do it just once, they continue to do it. They don't live for just one season. And of course in our climate zones here, some of the things that are typically annuals may persist for more than a year, but they're generally thought of as being able to complete their life cycle within a year. Some of our vegetable crops like tomatoes, you can, this year you probably grow them for the years and years, but normally they're considered an annual. <laughs> so that's what kind of relative terms. Depends on, depends on weather conditions and other things. But in their na natural environment, their native habitat, they were typically annuals. Um, <clears throat> We can also classify them uh, by their structure, uh, or excuse me, their growth habit or structure and form, um, and, and their life cycle. Uh, we, here's a tomato out here, it can be a, a vining crop, you can think of it as a vining crop as well as an annual um, in some cases. So we can, we can classify them by a variety of terms. They may have uh, woody uh, trees, shrubs, those kinds of forms as well. So how, how they grow and how they, what kind of form the plant takes can be used as well. Um, they're the type of leaf retention, are they evergreen or deciduous is what we're, excuse me, what we're most often concerned about here, leaf retention. Do they drop their leaves? Are they, are they leafless for a period of time if they're perennials? Uh, are, they, are they leafless for a period of time during the year and most years? Like many of many of our trees and shrubs may fall fall into that category where they're where they're dormant or they're not having any leaves on them at all for a period of time during the year, uh, usually in the winter period or the fall spring fall winter spring. Those are those are called deciduous plants. Evergreen plants are those that are are perennial in nature and tend to have leaf, green leaves on them on a continuing basis. Think of some of the conifers, for instance. <coughs> or azaleas, for instance, that tend to have, they, they never are leafless. They do drop leaves, and are, but they tend to be either immediately replaced or the old leaves fall off after the new, ones, a new flush of growth comes on. So you notice under your, under your pine tree, there's, if you have a large pine tree, you'll have a lot of, of uh, old needles, the needle straw under there. Those are the old leaves, the old leaves that have fallen off. They're falling off constantly, and the new ones are growing in flushes on that once or twice a year or whatever it might be. So they do lose leaves, they just are never leafless for a pronounced period of time. The evergreen plants. What is their climatic adaptation of a plant? Um, is it adapted to, to, we did think of them as either tropical, subtropical, or temperate, are the, are the three major categories. The tropical <coughs> plants are usually injured by, by severe cold or frost and can't tolerate any pronounced cold period during the year. <clears throat> excuse me, the, the tropic or excuse me, temperate one, plants tend to, uh, are adapted well to conditions where there is a pronounced cold period in the, during the course of the winter uh, months typically. You know, things from the north, northern tier of, uh, of the United States uh, are, are plants that would do that. Many of those are oftentimes deciduous, not always, but they tend to be deciduous or go dormant during that period. But they can they can they can be uh, maintain maintain their uh, growth. I'm sorry, growth. They can remain alive with during pronounced cold periods. And then that subtropical uh, or semi semi tropical group would be those that are kind of in our climate zone here. We're really kind of subtropical here in San Diego and Southern California. About the only tropical uh, climate zones in the United States would be Hawaii and the very southern portion of Florida uh, would be considered tropical where, where there's really almost never a frost, any freezing temperatures. So anything in between that and, and in between that and, and the temperate zones would be subtropical, which is where we're at. And, and we tend to get some cool periods, but we don't get a lot of pronounced hard freezes for a bit where we're below freezing for a long period of time. I mean, if we're below freezing for a day or two, it's a, long, it's a cold period for us. So plants might be adapted to any three of those, any one of those three uh, type of climate zones in general. We can also classify plants by how we use them. 
Are they an ornamental? Are they a vegetable? Are they a fruit? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and so we, we can classify them according to that category as well. Um, and of course with any plant, we, we can use a, a, all of these terms could be used to describe any given plant. For instance, we could have a, 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 an annual vining plant, an annual plant, excuse me, that's a vine that is, uh, uh, of course, going to, is, may or may not be evergreen if it's only an annual, but if it, it's, if leaf retention may or may not play a role in that case, but it may be a tropical plant and it's used as an ornamental. So all of those, all of these classification groupings can be used, are used to describe individual plants oftentimes. Does that make sense? Okay, so but it is important to understand where plants, what plants are adapted to, and where they come from in terms of being able to classify them according to these categories. And in terms of the use, there's the I think it's, we talk about it in the book a bit, um, a fruit and a vegetable. There's the botanic classification of a fruit and a vegetable, and there's a horticultural classification. Typically, the horticulturally we think of things that are fruits as being that part plant parts that are used as, as in a dessert form typically, whereas in a true botanic fashion, a fruit is anything that forms from a flower and produces a seed. So there's a little little discrepancy there, but don't get hung up on it. Just a, depends on what perspective you're coming from. And the biggie that we really are most interested in and oftentimes to describe plants is either by botanical or scientific name. Uh, which are uh, which is really comes down there's a Latin a two term Latin name a Latin binomial like a first name last name that we'll talk about here in a minute we'll get into this at some length because this is really the important thing we we have a common name for a plant that might be a, um, a butterfly bush or whatever but we really want to, oftentimes we would need to know its scientific name because what we call butterfly bush here may be called something else in some other part of the country some other country or down the street, somebody may refer to it as another common name. But the scientific or botanical name is true no matter where you go. It's, it's the name for that plant uh, worldwide. And so how do we, how we get to there is what I'll talk about in a minute. But it's the most precise form. It's the least confusing. Um, names do change. Latin names or by scientific names do change over time as plants may be reclassified. Um, but they're, they're, the classification of plants is really based primarily on taxonomic features, although with the, with the, with the advances of, uh, of our uh, knowledge of genetics, plant genetics, and molecular biology, uh, we're getting, they're getting more, uh, they're more readily able to identify plants and, and identify plants groupings, what, what, where they, what they're related to based on their genetics, right, at the genetic code level. So they don't look at gross taxonomic features like they used to. They used to look largely at flower parts and, and use those to describe or, or um, describe names, assign names, and to assign uh, relationships of plants. Now we're getting down to the genetic level, molecular level, really, with plants to define, to decide where they shake out. So there's a lot of upheaval in terms of nomenclature right now, in some cases, depending on the plants and species. So there's a lot of shifting back and forth. And we always have the lumpers and the splitters uh, in the world, so you know how that goes. But there is a there is a, a, a hierarchy. There's a, a, an international society, uh, groups of societies that agree to those what what makes sense out of the science as presented by individuals that say, hey, I think this plant ought to be called something else or assigned with another grouping of plants because of its genetic makeup is more closely aligned or its its taxonomic features more closely aligned. So that's that's constantly going on. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't in impact a lot of horticultural plants on a regular basis, although it does change over time. One, one of the best um, databases for that is from the Missouri uh, Botanic Gardens. They have a database, it's called Tropicos, T-R-O-P-I-C-O-S. Um, and you can, you can look up plants by their scientific names in there, and it'll, it'll give you uh, Kind of the, it'll also give it synonyms for that, what it used to be called, or what it's also known as. If there's another scientific name that it was once called in the past, it gives you kind of that uh, sense. Okay. 
We won't, there's a whole, that could take a whole day's lecture on that, but we won't get into, we'll get into a little bit of this, so I'll, I, does, uh, the, does the database have an audio where they pronounce it? Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> That's left to the reader. Yes, yes. ma'am. Uh, some people are asking what the name of the um, website is. I will include it. Oh, in Tropicos? The, so I'll include it in the newsletter. So T-R-O-P-I-C-O-S. Um, it's at the Missouri Botanic Garden is the one who manages that. Yes, it's in yes. St. Louis. Yeah. And there are others out there, but that's the, one of the most easily used and, and one of the most complete. Okay. Um, currently, in the in the in the in the biological world, uh, those of you that are maybe my generation or around that. Uh, when I when I was in college and so forth, we had two kingdoms, right? And there was a plant and animal, and maybe there's a third one with some of these other things that didn't quite fit. Well, that's that's they blew the hell out of that a long time ago, uh, or recently, I should say. Now, kingdom, there's a there's a there's a group a, a subgrouping even above that. Now, there's three dom what they call domains or super kingdoms. I don't even know how they work exactly myself because I haven't studied it in great detail. And then under those, there's now six kingdoms, um, and there are one of those kingdoms is still plant the plant kingdom, planty. And there's ten divisions within the plant kingdom. And we're getting closer. You know, we're getting, as we go down for each step, we're getting more closely related here. And most of the flowering plants uh, are are in this. Uh, and, and horticulturally important plants are in this uh, in five five of these divisions. Not all, but most of them kind of fit into that. So if you get into these divisions, there's groups that are some of these divisions are flowering plants and some of them are non-flowering plants. So if you want to really get in the bottom of it, which we won't, but just so you're aware of that, okay. Um, so that's kind of the way it shakes out now, and. Um, just we're we're going to be concerned about the plant kingdom, and and the gene the general form this still fits. Well, they used to have just a couple of kingdoms. This is still kind of the hierarchy. You're going to have so you're going to be a, a kingdom, and the, the divisions I mentioned are phylum, the big divisions. And we get down, 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 and get each plant gets shifted over. So as we get farther down the down here, we get down to a specific plant. And these last two terms, or last three terms. The species and the genus are the are the specific names of a given plant. Here's the family it's in. Here's the order it's in, and so forth. So, all the all the uh, plants of a given genus will be in a, in a family of other genuses, and they're closely related plants. And when we go on up, they get less uh, less similar in nature. But we're going to be concerned in horticulture and in our from our discussion here about these last three terms. We're going to talk about genus, species, and cultivar. Uh, I don't want to say, I don't get into this too much, but um, there, it's important to know that there's two groups of, of plants, there's seed-bearing plants, um, that, that we have, there's conifers, which you're all aware of, pines and some of that group. Um, they, they, their flowers are, uh, or their, their, their seeds are born in these cones. They're not true flowers, but they're born in these cones. The seeds are in the cones. So they're naked. The seeds are exposed when they're in that fruit type of thing. Okay? Not, they're, not they're not true fruits or flowers, but they're analogous to that. And the other group of plants that are important to us are those that have their seeds enclosed in some kind of a fruit. These are the true flowering plants. And this is where most of the horticultural plants are in this group, although there are several in this one. But the large majority of them are going to be these flowering plants that have a fruit, uh, a seed encased in a fruit in some way. That's two big groupings. And then we also have big groupings across plants that are important to understand from a horticultural level. <coughs> Excuse me. Are those that are, are broadleaf or narrowleaf plants, the grasses and the broadleaf plants, so to speak, is another way of looking at them. Um, <laughs> technically, they're called dicots and monocots because the monocot, mono meaning one, di meaning two, 
cot is a Latin term for a seed leaf. So dicots, when they seeds germinate, they have two seed leaves that come up when that seed when that seed emerges. You think of you've ever grown tomato seedlings? You get two little seed leaves. That are, they're not like the true leaf of the plant, but they're two little seed leaves that come up. And what if you've ever started a lawn seed or grass seed? When it comes up, it's one little spear, right? And that's a monocot. It's one seed leaf comes up. And they're very different, even though they're all flowering plants, they're very different, have uh, some very different uh, physiological properties that are unique to that to the two-leaf plant group versus the one-leaf plant group. And we, can, we, we will use that, uh, in, in horticulture we use that. Very, uh, one, one key example is if you use uh, if you use a, a lawn weed killer to kill the dandelions in your front lawn, it doesn't kill the lawn, right? Because that particular chemical is, is toxic only to, to the dicot family of plants. It doesn't hurt the grasses because of the, because of the physiological property it, inter, inter, it erupts in that plant. It's unique to those plants and not to the monocots. So knowing that, you can put it on grasses and not worry about damaging them and, and vice versa. You can damage most of the broadleaf plants in some way. Okay, so that, that's one example of how that's why it's important. Um, and also with these dicot monocot plants, they're they're structurally very different, in addition to having some physiological properties. In a dicot, those that have the two seed leaves, which are most of our plants, uh, majority of our horticultural plants, I should say, um, they tend to have a vascular system that's arranged in somewhat of a concentric circle. Uh, it doesn't look like it too much there, but they, they do. I'll show another photo of it that's a little more, uh, a little more uh, convincing. Uh, the monocots, however, have their vascular tissues, these little bundles of, of vascular tissues. They're scattered. These are cut, these little dots in here represent vascular tissue that we'll talk about specifically in a minute. Okay? But they're scattered in here, in the dicots, they tend to be organized around in, in, a, in a ring or a series of rings. Also, dicots tend to have broad, broad leaves. The monocots have these uh, with, with net, with net veins, like a palm or a net veining in the leaves. And the monocots are grass-like leaves. They're, they're long and narrow. The veins go parallel. Okay. So here's all the major features as well. So the dicots, two seed leaves, they're broad leaf plants, branch veins. Their flower parts are often in, are, are always in multiples of fours or fives. So the different pieces of the flower, we'll talk about, are always going to be in fours or fives. Or, or multiples of fours or fives, 16, 20, that kind of thing. Vascular tissues and concentric rings. They, they tend to have fibrous roots or woody roots either way, depending on the type of plant that it is. Because uh, trees, of course, have woody roots, things that are more annual in nature wouldn't. Monocots, uh, in addition to the narrow leaves and grasses that have a parallel veining, their flower parts are in multiples of three. Three, six, nine, that kind of thing. Um, their vascular tissues are scattered in bundles, and their roots are typically always fibrous in nature. <laughs> so what, what's a classic kind of weird monocot that you may think is a dicot? How about palms? They're, they're a monocot. They're in this group over here. They're they're a tree tree like monocot. So not all monocots are not are, are small plants or grassy plants. They're in the grass family, but they're not all grass like plants. They do have these features in common. You ever seen a palm palm seedling come up? If you get a yeah one leaf, right? Their roots are generally very fibrous. Their vascular tissues scattered in there. Okay, um, I thought I had another photo of the stems, but maybe that's coming up later. Anyway, yeah, it's coming up later. The stems, so, but keep that in mind. So we're back to this, and we're going to focus on this down here now. Genus, species, and cultivar. Okay, so those are the terms we're going to use a lot of in, in horticulture. So a Latin binomial, those two names, there's two terms, two Latin names, genus. Genus and species down there. And 
tip, it, technically it's a, a genus name and a specific epithet. You can think of the genus name as kind of like the last name, like Smith, and the first name would be John, would be the specific epithet, John Smith. Um, and Smith, Joe, Smith, Kathy, so forth. And we, we together, when these are used together, we, we generically, informally call that a species. So together we call those a species. When we, that's a species of plant. I'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, so it's not technically correct to do that, but that's the way we say it. It's just colloquially, okay? Um, specific epithet is really this term here that we use rather than what that's called. So together we call them species. So, for instance, um, American sweet gum, liquid ambar, is its, is its genus name, and styrocyphula is its, its uh, specific epithet. And we call that species American sweet gum. There are other liquid ambar, uh, in the genera of, of the genus of liquid ambar, there are other species names. There are other ones. There's a oriental one, and there's some. There's at least two or three that are horticulturally used in other parts of the world. But this is American sweet gum. If we had liquid ambar or something else, it would be a different species of liquid ambar. Yes, ma'am. So these scientific names are used globally. So I go to some foreign garden somewhere. Uh huh. Either somebody's going to tell me what this is, and I'll understand it, right? So we all Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and they're used like in the Sunset Western Garden book. They'll have the genus and species in there. You know, you, you look them up um, largely by that. That's the terminology they use in there because so, they're trying to keep keep the, the confusion down. They'll list the common names after that, but you'll have to know that you have to have some, generally, some idea what this uh, scientific name is in order to use that effectively by using their index in the back or whatever. And usually plant tags will oftentimes have both, have that on there. May not always be correct, but it's on there, but don't know when they're correct. Um, variety, that term's used a lot too. We talk about a, a variety. Well, I want a variety of this or a variety of that. Technically, from a botanic perspective, botanical perspective, a variety a variety is a uh, subgroup of species. It's, it's like liquid ambar, styrocyphala, and then there's a grouping that in nature, they tend to have maybe a little different leaf size or fall color or something. Just someone sees it out and you can see it in nature that develops out there. They have some unique, specific traits that are, are very, very specific to that group. And they may, they're normally naturally occurring, but they could be developed by breeding, too. We've done that by breeding. So that's a variety. So it's, it's, we'll have varieties within a genus, or excuse me, within a species of plant. In horticulture, though, we tend to, when we've, when we've intentionally developed a variety of a plant, selected a plant for its, you know, a liquid amber for a specific fall color, for instance, which most of them are, a specific growth form, habit, growth habit, that's very upright or something, um, we call that a cultivated variety because it was intentionally, it wasn't just found in nature out there, it was intentionally developed or we found it in nature, we, we expanded upon it. We call that a cultivated variety, or the shortened form of that is cultivar. The term we usually use. And they can be developed either from a sexual uh, uh, reproduction by, by seeds, crossing plants that way, or from, from taking cuttings, some asexual way by taking cuttings or some other means of just propagating from a specific plant. So the unique thing about plants is that they have because of their, they have the ability to redevelop plant parts from many, an entire plant from the given plant part in most cases. Many plants do. And some, it varies from plant to plant, whether you can take a root, a cutting from a root or a shoot or something, many times you can develop a whole plant for that. Because all the genetic code is in those cells, in the nucleus of each of those cells. It's just a matter of what, what is expressed is determined by the environment and other things. So, and another term that's used you probably heard it was a clone. And it's a particular type of cultivar. A clone is, is, a, is a cultivated variety where all the genetic materials, they're exactly identical plants. There's nothing different about them. And those are, those are, can only be done through asexual propagation. 
because if we have any crossbreeding with flowers and so forth, we get some, the, genetic, the gene pool is a little bit different. Even though the plants might look similar, the genes are not, are a little bit different in there. So a, a clone can only be developed from, from cuttings or some other means asexually in a plant. And all those plants would be identical. They're taken from that original plant. Okay? So a clone is a cultivar, right? A particular type of cultivar, but a cultivar is not necessarily a clone. Because a cultivar could be derived from either a sexual or asexual means. So that's what that gets to there. And I'll talk just briefly about this because the question comes up occasionally about hybrids and all this type of stuff. Uh, at this point, um, hybrids are, 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 are crosses, genetic crosses between two different plants um, within, a, within a, a, a species, typically, or they could be across species. And the plants are, are, are and in horticulture, we usually manipulate who the parents are. So if we have uh, uh, tomatoes, for instance, the, 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 some varieties of tomatoes that are, that are developed as hybrids, we will have a male parent that's producing the pollen and a female parent that's developing the fruit. And those will be those lines will be developed. We know this the male line has a certain trait we want and the female line has a certain trait we want. When we cross those, we get either a, a, a better expression of those two traits or we get a particular expression that's different than either of those bring forward. Um, and that's that's a hybrid. And that's what we're and we control that. So each year they develop, they make those same crosses and develop seed from that cross. The seed taken from the offspring of that cross will have this mix of genetic genes in it. If you, if you put those out and plant, uh, have those flower and develop fruit and seeds, the seeds from those offspring of the hybrids will not be like the, necessarily like the, the original plant was. They'll be different. You don't know what you're going to get. There'll be, some of them will be the same, some of them, most of them will be very different. So that's why it's hard to hard not recommend any safe seeds from hybrids because they don't come true. Um, yeah? Are all hybrids in a manipulated by man? You don't have that in nature? Oh, it happens naturally, too. Okay, so it's yeah. not just, yeah, they blow it But in there. horticulture, we're trying to, we, get, okay. we, we you know, we're breeding a particular type of yeah. variety for a specific right. need. But they could happen naturally right. in some cases. Yeah. Uh, and so there's another group of, of varieties that we develop, or cultivars, that have been developed that are, are known as open pollinated types. We don't, we don't control the males and the females. We just, uh, some of the tomato varieties, the older varieties of tomatoes, would be called open pollinated. Uh, and and with, with plants that have uh, crops that have, uh, where the plants have both male and female flowers on the same plant, uh, that that can be worked out very well because the, the pollen is very controlled. We know the, the, the genetics going in aren't going to be very different. And once we have a pretty uniform plant, we could grow a whole field of them, collect the seed from that, and they're going to come pretty true. It's going to be very little different because there's nothing else. The whole field is about the same kind of plant, and all the plants are, are pollinating from themselves. There's not pollen coming in from some other distant source. It's called. So those, those varieties are the old varieties, and, and all the so-called uh, heirloom varieties are typically open pollinated varieties. They're not better, they're not worse, but um, what we usually get with hybrids, we usually get more vigorous plants uh, from hybrids, and we, have, we know what the exact outcome's gonna be. Open pollinated, they're gonna be very close, there may be slight variation, but they're not gonna vary much from plant to plant, certainly not noticeably, they won't vary. The crop you get won't be different from uh, batch to batch or from plant to plant. And in this case, if you save seeds from these open pollinated types of varieties, they tend to come true to, true to type because that's the way they're propagated anyway. So you don't have this, you don't have to worry about uh, losing the, the, the type of variety characteristics. Yeah? So on the hybrids, if, if every, every season you have to make the... The, uh, the seed company will do that or whoever's yeah, selling okay, the seed. So you always have to make new seeds. Right. Cross it, you have to do the cross Right. Over to get that same combination of traits. Yes, ma'am? Um, for open pollination, don't you have to have some control over what 
around it? I mean, yeah, you, you tend to isolate the field to okay. develop the seed from that. But you'd have one you know, big boy tomato, for instance, you'd have five acres of big boy tomatoes and nothing else, and hopefully no tomatoes around it, it just to ensure you don't get problems. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. But if you, let's say you buy, you know, two varieties of summer squash, open pollinated. Okay, you buy two varieties of squash. Seed, okay. and uh -huh. in a small garden, you plant them nearby. They, each plant has male and female flowers, correct? Right. Those can cross. Yeah, they could cross. Okay. Be a two, in, because of the proximity. They could, yeah. Okay. You don't know that they will or they won't. Yeah. I don't know what the probability is they will or won't, but. But it's not a guarantee can, that you're safe to see. It yeah, that's right. You're not guaranteed that they're going to come through the next time. Okay. That's correct. Okay. One more question? Yeah. Can you ask um, the hybrids? I know hybrids open pollinated. Can there be open pollinated hybrids? Or no, they're two different. They have to be two different. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. Mm. Well, we will get into all that. I guess as it gets, I'll skip that one. Um, that's just talking about that. Oh, that's just how we get. Don't worry about that. Again. That's not that important. What's way over the, over the top of this class? Um, we we can have um, varieties. Oops. We can have varieties that are um, from. It, it, the question was about in nature. Can they occur? And in horticulture, usually we have two species or two lines of plants that are crossed and give us a hybrid, which would be the first one. They're in the same genera. You know, they're all, they're all tomatoes. Um, but uh, we, in, in nature and, and even in horticulture, we can sometimes get crosses between two different genera that are closely related. Um, you know, I, like the, I like the Homer Simpson thing where they had to, he, they developed a tomato. <laughs> Tomatoes and tobacco. <laughs> that was hilarious. And, and you know, and, and there, are, there are situations where you can do it. The, the genera are close enough related, you can cross, they will cross pollinate. And that sometimes happens in nature, or we can manipulate it in men. And, and when we see that done, and when we see a hybrid list, names listed, um, when we do the genus and species names, so this would be two species in the same genera crossed. So they would be uh, in, in, a, in magnolia, two, two species of magnolia cross. And when we see when we write it, we put there's an X between the, the genus name and the, and the species specific epithet name. Because magnolia X solangiana, saucer magnolia, is, is actually a cross of two species of magnolia, these two species. I don't know which was male, which was female, but that's the two species that that uh, form this hybrid. And the X designates that it's a species, it's a hybrid of two species in that genus. If we would if we would cross two different genera, so Mahonia, uh, Oregon grape, and uh, Barberry, they're closely related genera. Um, then that then the X is preceding both the genus and the species names, and this is the uh, this is the and the, the genus is not going to be either. It's going to be a combination usually of the two or some other hybrid name. So the Mahoberis aquasus sargentii is uh, is going to be the cross of these two genera. Sometimes happens. Okay. But that's a known, that was done intentionally, or they traced it back. I don't know which way it was, but it's, it's a known, known hybrid. Dennis? Yes. Who Pardon. comes up with these names? <laughs> Not me. Sorry. Um, well, you, usually I don't have an example, but if you, if you look in, in a, like a, in the Tropic Coast database, any database, usually at the F, after those scientific names, there'll be a, a an abbreviated names of like uh, and they may say may say um, oh would be a common one um, uh, there'll be somebody's name after that either abbreviated form or whatever and that's the authority that named that species and, and they'll come up with usually these are Latin terms that describe some of the features of the plant or oftentimes the and oftentimes the specific epithet will carry uh, a Latinized version of the name of the person who found that plant 
So these are all Latin terms, and normally they are used. To, they, they, they oftentimes describe some specific features unique to that plant, or where it was from, or something. Yes. The uh, San Marcos Nursery website has a wonderful description. Very. Oh, where they come from? Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, and that may be in the Tropicos database too. I don't remember. There's different places that how the what those terms mean. Um, the other. Uh, let's see. Do I have this one here? Yeah, we'll get to this. Okay, next. So the binomial we're, we're used, working with in horticulture oftentimes is a genus and a species and then a cultivar okay, or a variety name in horticulture. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is the right point or if I can answer it, but I'll let's say you, know. you have a dwarf species of something. A dwarf species, okay. Where does that appear? If it's the same thing but it's dwarf. Right? If it's a dwarf version of a certain thing, it would usually be in the, in the most commonly it would be at the cultivar designation. Okay. Or if it's prostrate, if it's low growing, they'll say prostratus or prostrate, something like that. Okay? That's usually where it is. If, so the question was if you have a dwarf form or a specific growing for, type of growth form of a given species, how does it designate? It's usually at the cultivar level because it's a sp specific type of that plant, variety of that plant. And so in this case, we would have liquid amber styrocyphala and maybe the cultivar might be Palo Alto. There's a number of cultivars of liquid amber that are typically selected for their fall color and, and or their growth form, upright or spreading or something like that. And when you, these are also typically clones because they're asexually propagated and so they're going to have very true to type. If you want all the liquid ambers in your property to be the same fall color at about the same time, you'd want to select all from the same cultivar. If you don't want that, then you select a mix of them, or you select seedling types too. Because some of, not all liquid ambers that are sold are cultivar. Some of them are just seedlings too. There's a lot of seedlings out there. If they don't have a name, a name after them, they're probably not a cultivar. Um, also, the designation here, the genus and species, when they're in text, those terms are always italicized or underlined, and the cultivar is either is. is if, if the is typically in, in, in uh, single quotes or, or straight type, not a pal size. Is the cultivar the same as the common name? Sometimes. Okay. Not, always. not always. Not always. So this is, the common name for this is American Sweet Gum. The cultivar is American, or the, the cultivar is Palo Alto. So it may or may not be, but normally the common name is not the cultivar, but it could be. Okay. So prunus species here, we have a prunus genera, avium, prunus avium is a uh, bing, would be the, uh, would be what? Yeah, sweet cherry. And prunus persica o. Henry, ever heard of that one? You don't shop at Costco. <laughs> That's a peach, one of the peach cultivars. Yeah, fruit, uh, pe peaches and cherries are in the stone fruit family, and they all have a similar, that stone, hard stone is a seed, that's what's unique about them, uh, their fruits are very similar, they're all prunus. So the unique thing there, if you know the genus and species, particularly if you know the genus, if there's a disease problem, for instance, or a pest problem, oftentimes it's similar across the genus, Some, it's not always, but oftentimes you can predict cultural requirements and, and uh, pest problems based on knowing the genus. Okay, what's that one? Beefsteak tomato. <clears throat> so when we have all these together, that's, that's, that's kind of what they would be like. And again, the scientific name is of the genus and species names are always italicized and the cultivar technically should be single quotes. Or the variety if it's called that. Okay, many fruits and vegetables are hybrids, that's true. Um, okay, uh, we're going to go about five more minutes or so, five to ten more minutes, okay, and then we'll take a break. I want to get into plant structure. That was a quick overview of, of terminology, but the main thing is Genus, species, and cultivar, okay, or variety of names. I'm going to give some background on how those are developed.
Yeah. Um, just in terms of shorthand, how you write things, on the previous slide you had prunus and then the second reference was P period. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what you do if they follow, the if you have a list of prunuses, you can, okay. yeah, P period can be used mm -hmm. as shorthand. Or if they're in a list. Okay, um, we're going to talk now about plant structure, and we'll get back to that monocot dicot thing in a minute too. It'll, it'll enter into the discussion here. Um, we're going to start with a kind of uh, generic term, uh, different parts of the plant. We're going to start kind of from the bottom, uh, but we're going to talk about meristems, which can occur in various parts of the plant. Meristems are tissues in the plant, which are uh, where growth occurs in the plant. So we have meristem areas at the tips of the roots, because those are growing. We have at the tips of the shoots, and we sometimes have them in stems, where the stems will increase in diameter and growth. Okay. Those are the three key areas that they occur. So the shoot, shoots uh, will, uh, shoot mirror stems result in increase in, in either width, breadth of the overall canopy or, or height of the canopy, length of the stems, in other words. And roots will expand and grow outward from the tips because of the mirror stems there. And then they can, roots and, and roots and stems actually can have mirror stems along their length that will result in increase in diameter. Not all, but some of them, are, some stems can do that. Not all stems do that, but. Um, we have what's called primary and secondary growth, too. And, and, and what, we, what we would term as apical mirror stems, those are the ones at the shoot tips, okay, out there, or the root tips, the very apices of the plant. Those are where primary growth occurs. New, new tissues are laid down, new cells are formed, the cells divide, create new, have more cells, and those cells expand in size from little cells to larger cells to a certain size, and we get growth occurring there. So that's, that's where primary growth would be. Uh, roots and shoots. So it's primarily associated with increase in growth. Primary growth is largely increase in, in uh, length, I should say, not growth, increase in length. And then there are what we call lateral or secondary growth meristem. That's the increase in diameter stuff, okay? Lateral meaning sideways. So that's where secondary growth, this occurs largely in, in stems of some plants or also could occur in roots of some plants as I mentioned. And when it's in stems or roots, stems and roots that are capable of increasing in diameter will have this tissue called a candium or something similar to that in it. That's the meristematic area of the stem that results in an increase in growth and diameter when it occurs. It's common in, in trees uh, which have wood and bark associated with them. Okay? That's where candium most commonly occurs in woody plants, some woody plants. Increase in diameter. So these are, are, are photomicrographs of, uh, of meristem areas. This is a shoot tip. Um, and these are the new forming leaves here, okay, on this shoot. These are, these are emerged leaves. You can probably see them easily. This would be the meristem area right in here where there's new cells dividing and forming and developing into these leaf tissues here, the new little leaf emerging here. So it's in the, in the very shoot tip. That's what you can see if you cut longitudinally through that. Um, in a stem, a, a, a stem of a woody plant, a, a tree or a shrub, it's cut kind of at an angle across there in this case. This would be the bark right around here, the bark covering in this little green layer, this line that's formed around this green layer here. That would be the, the, the cambium or the, or the lateral meristem in that stem. <coughs> Usually the cambium, they're only a couple of cells deep, they're wide, and that's where new cells are forming that result in width of that growth of that stem. And they tend to be near the outer periphery of the stem. This is a root tip. All these little dots are the nucleuses in the cells. Okay? So the root tip here is dividing. These cells are dividing back here. And usually on a root tip, there's some large tough cells out here that enable the root to push, and then the new cells are dividing right behind it here. 
causing that root to extend out in length. Yes, sir. One of the recommendations made by some people, when you, when you buy a plant which is in a pot, and a pretty root bound, so you should cut the roots on the side. It seems to me if you do that, what you're doing is cutting out the apical mirror step. Yeah, you're probably cutting some of them. So, so should you do that or not do that? Um, I, I usually suggest you at least, if you don't cut it, you kind of loosen those roots and break off some of them, because you do want some lateral, you want the roots to see, they're going to continue to circle around in there and they're never going to fan out very easily if you don't cut them up. So yeah, you are you are cutting off some of the apical mirror stems. Some of those roots, however, will branch behind that break or that cut. And so you'll continue to, those will continue to grow from that point. Some of them aren't cut and will continue to grow okay. But you're trying to get that root ball to kind of fan out a little bit instead of just growing in a circle. So even if you cut a root, it can still then regenerate a mirror stem yeah, there'll be, we'll talk about that in a minute. There's probably a, a place where it will branch in, in most cases, not all roots, but some of them, many of them will. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question? I was going to ask the same question about cutting off the top of it, because the mirror stems always have the, always have the top yeah, of it. So yeah, so you, right. So how, how, they, but they keep growing, so they make more, they make a, a new one? We'll, we'll talk about that in a second, yeah, on the stem. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So that's the growing points in a plant. 